Hi everybody and welcome to another conscious conversation. And today I have a very special guest with me in this conversation and that is Jennifer Swanson. Jennifer Swanson along with being my friend and a fellow conscious coach is also a brain based personal and family therapeutic coach. She specializes in trauma, neural behavioral coaching for families who experience brain differences, parent coaching and neural retraining. She is also a mom to a beautifully neurodiverse child. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here today. And tell us more about your work. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity to come and be amongst your community. Yeah, so in my work that relates to our conversation today, I work a lot with families to link behavior to brain function and um, so that we can create optimal environments for children and adults to thrive that experience brain difference. So I work a lot with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, really passionate about educating the public about it because there's not a lot of information out there and it is very underdiagnosed um, and also with any other brain conditions such as autism, ADHD or anxiety. The um, intention for uh, having this conversation is for us as um, the community that follows me is usually uh, parents and uh, teachers. And my intention is for them to embrace neurodiversity in a way that we can um, show up and be there for uh, children with neurodiversity in the way that they need us to. So I really want to learn uh, and um, understand this from you. To begin with, I'd like to um, ask you to share with us, you know, uh, what is neurodiversity? Just in terms of a common man, like if I didn't know anything and I was asking you, what's neurodiversity? How would you explain it? Well, I think neurodiversity is just normalizing the fact that every single one of us on the planet has a brain that is operating differently. You know, an activity that I like to do in workshops is to have everyone draw a picture of their brain. And it's a really fun thing to actually do in classrooms as well, because as we look around the room and everyone shares kind of how they process thoughts and what their brain looks like, we get a really good idea that every single brain is different. And so that's part of the acceptance piece is that we are all wired differently and that we all have unique brains and that is what neurodiversity is. So that that kind of brings us into that full acceptance. Yeah. And I, I like how you uh, say uh, all our brains are so different and that's so true, right? Because no two brains think alike or uh, see things alike or learn alike. But having said this, the Montessori curriculum, okay, and I'm a Montessori educator and the people who follow me are many of them are teachers who have got trained in this method from uh, the center that I have. So we say in the Montessori uh, curriculum that we are an inclusive education. And uh, while we understand this term inclusive from um, a very broad sense, we, I think as teachers, knowing some very uh, fundamental basics of how does an environment become uh, inclusive? Well, I think first and foremost, it is an attitude and attitudes are part of the environment. And it's also the energy that we have. I think all of us can understand what it's like to go to a party where you are with a bunch of friends that accept you versus when you go and you're not really accepted and it's not somewhere where you feel welcomed. And I think these kids that have these exceptionalities are more sensitive and they can really feel this. I mean, all of us can feel it. So I think that true inclusion starts with our attitude and our energy towards the person, our level of acceptance of who they are as a being coming into the environment. And then also seeing in what ways we can include them in the activity that is right for them according to where their strengths and stretches are and meeting them with a just right challenge, right? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So having those accommodations put in place for them so that they can participate. And if it is something that is way outside their their range of tolerance, then maybe having them do something else at that time. Mm-hmm. I have so many <laughs> examples, so many examples of this, but you know, for instance, um, like part of linking brain function to behavior is noticing when there's a poor fit in the environment for the child. And um, with my daughter, she wasn't going to kindergarten well, and this is years ago, she's 11 now. And um, we had to actually break down the different brain tasks that it took in order for her to integrate into the environment. So she had to transition from home to school. She had to be able to communicate, which was difficult for her. She had to walk through different sensory lighting to get into the room. There was all new smells. It was much busier. There were kids bumping into each other. And this is a child that needs a lot of space. And then there was also, you know, being asked to timely take your gear off. So there's all these different brain tasks that are happening all at once. And for a child that has slower processing and needs space and struggles with transition, we had to look at how we could adapt the environment for her. So in their little cubbies where they would hang their coats, I saw when I was dropping her off that she was actually placed in the middle of of all of the kids. And so I asked to actually have her placed on the end of the cubbies so that she could actually step away from the group to get undressed. And I also asked if we could come into the class five minutes before the other kids. So that allowed for her to come in, to settle in the quiet, and then watch the kids filter into the classroom. And uh, it worked out beautifully, you know, then she was able to grab her things at recess and step to the side and not get lost, you know, with all of the sounds and movement and kerfuffle of all of the kids. Um, and, And she started going to school every single day beautifully. So sometimes it's just these small modifications and being aware of what the child's experience is, how their brain is working, and what is being asked of them in the moment can really, really help them to be really successful. That's that's, uh, so beautiful at so many levels, you know. First thing is the observation that you have made as a parent right i'm just trying to break this down for those who are listening uh, what nuances go into this first thing as a parent you have made such beautiful observations and before that even uh, jennifer i want to bring to the point where you came to that from not a place of judgment but from a place of understanding what if why are you not going to school like there's a problem that was not your approach your approach was why are you not going to school that's so beautiful. Uh, I want to point to the um, people listening, how you have observed that the cubby is in the middle, that she needs to come out and take this. She needs five minutes more. She So you started entering the environment a little earlier. You requested the teacher, the teacher who may have not known your child like you do. So you have literally brought the teacher into your circle. That is you, your child and the teacher. And I love this because I think with um inclusive education the child the parent and the teacher we need to work together and that is so beautiful thank you for sharing that the two things that in the montessori environment we do is observation and we do isolation of difficulty which are the two things we do focus on however we get so stuck up in the presentation but then we are not looking at the same isolation of difficulty for our day-to-day tasks our everyday why is my child not wearing her uh, clothes why is she not buttoning it up why is she throwing a tantrum while wearing her clothes what could be something that's a difficult task that we are assuming is so easy the thing the thing for these kids too is that if we allow them they will help us to become so much more patient Um, and it's so important to be curious observers of them and to know that they have on and off days. So one day, maybe buttoning up their shirt or their coat is is easy, and the next day it's not. And that's just how it is for them. So we have to literally observe who they are now, right? Who they are this day when they walk in the room. Did they sleep? 
did they eat? You know, communicating with the parents, maybe having a little book going back and forth of anything that's happening in their life that has changed. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, really leaning into fostering that connection with the child so that they feel seen and they feel welcomed when they're coming into the environment is so huge. Yeah. I think uh, what stands out for me there is uh, allowing yourself to be calm. Uh, can you give us an example of how that allowing looks like? You know what, actually, it's interesting that you say that because something that um, has been coming up for me a lot is that you know, silence is actually its own love language when we talk about the different love languages, especially for these kids. And so I think the more that we practice with ourselves, being observers of ourselves through mindfulness or meditation and really noticing that we are actually not our thoughts, we're not the things that we do in this world, the more that we're able to connect with our own essence of who we are as beings, the more that we can allow these children to then show up in the world as the beings that they are, because they all have their own special gifts and ways that they're brilliant. And sometimes if we're not quiet and we don't mm -hmm. slow down, we will completely miss what that is for them. Yeah. So aligning with in our present moment is key to aligning with their present moment. For a lot of these kids too, their developmental age is different in different areas. So we need to be curious and patient. You know, emotionally, a 10 year old could be two years old, but then they might socially be 10 years old. So that would mean that they're very impulsive and they can have tantrums and be more easily upset. So we have to be so present to where they are developmentally mm -hmm. through all of the different ranges of their development yeah yeah and what you're saying reminds me of uh, recently I saw a post that you had put up uh, can you ex talk a little bit about that I think it's really important to again observe and notice how old is this child you know with their gross motor skills with their fine motor skills how old are they socially? What what ways do they like to play? You know, are they older and they still like to pretend play? And if that's the case, how can we set up an environment so that they still have the opportunity to do these things and feel included? You know, is there a way that we can take them into some of the classrooms where there are younger kids as kind of, you know, a role model or a helper so they can still experience some of the learning that's happening in those younger grades, which they may still need, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's about, you know, making them feel empowered and understanding where they are. And every single child is so different. Mm -hmm. Every, you know, there's no two kids with autism or FASD or ADHD that are wired the same or having the same experience. And that, so that's what the problem with labels are, is that they're mm -hmm. great because they help us get funding and they help us get uh, services that we need, but they don't say much about who the person or the child is aside from the label. And that's what we need to be curious about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why and I, I love your meditation so much as well. You know, they help you to become present and they help you to find that stillness. And can I be okay in that stillness? And can I be okay in that stillness and hold the space for this other child? Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And but what I think comes as an obstacle and I tell me if you agree with me or not on this, uh, the obstacle that comes is the developmental parameter that we are looking at. Right. So can you talk a little bit about that, like the developmental parameter, which is this child and this child alone? Yeah, I'm so passionate about this because, you know, not being seen and not being accepted, especially for sensitive kids, that causes trauma. You know, there's there's no there's no sugarcoating it. And so I think it's so important that we don't try to put them into boxes because these kids are not going to fit into our boxes. They are on their own trajectory and they have their own ways and their own timelines to where they're going to get mm -hmm. to where they're going to get. They may never get to where we expect them to get. You know, so we have to honor their process and who they are as beings mm -hmm. and not be so outcome performance based, you know, when it comes to how much we accept them as beings. And I yeah. think a reality check for us too, like what what is this illusions that we are sitting in and 
thinking that this is the way, uh, which may not be the way at all uh, to begin with, right? I think that questioning mind is very helpful with any child because then we allow the children to unfold in the patterns that are meant for them. So I think that's a good point to bring up and I want to reiterate that for the listeners is that uh, the developmental charts that you see need to be put away and I would suggest put it away for any child because then you can form a developmental pattern for your child based on your observations. That comes to another question when we say there's nothing to fix, right? This is something we say in the conscious parenting uh, language where there's nothing to fix. What would you say to this uh, parent and to understand that there is no fixing, the child is whole and complete? Just as they are. Yeah, you know, I think first and foremost is just honoring where they are in their journey because there is a grieving process that needs to happen, right? Before we kind of wake up to the fact that there really is nothing to fix, that Mm -hmm. these children are perfect. Mm -hmm. And it's hard as a parent because, you know, you have this child and you see them as being whole and perfect when they're born. And then the world slowly tells you differently, you know, and it's, it's painful because you know who your child is at home. And then immediately you're bombarded with therapists and family and friends and society pointing out all the ways that your child is essentially broken, you know, and needs to catch up. So, it's about kind of undoing that conditioning slowly and recognizing in ourselves, in what ways am I uncomfortable with being different and going against the flow, right? In what ways am I uncomfortable with speaking up and being seen? I love how you say, um, we expect children to catch up with us or the curriculum, but how about us catching up with the children? And I know like for myself as a parent, my experience has been anytime that I push my child, that energy creates resistance. And anytime I just allow her, she blows my mind. And in her own time, you know, for instance, even this week, we had been trying to swim for years and I just kind of started taking her to the pool and letting her just play. I went for years of trying to push her, like, you need to kick. And she wasn't there, you know, like she (laughs) was more about splashing and being there. And I had this goal that she needed to swim. And, you know, then we kind of shifted into her just playing and I just allowed her to get comfortable in the water. And then just this week, she's on vacation with her dad and she's staying at families on a lake and she put her life jacket on grabbed two poo noodles, jumped in the water, and she has been swimming around the lake by herself. Oh, so everything <laughs> is in her own time, you know? And I'm so, I'm so proud of her, but mm. I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about it a lot because I don't want her to think that her worth comes from her performance, whether she does things or not. I'm so proud of her intrinsic motivation. Yeah. You know, I'm so proud of her for feeling confident and ready and then yep. taking the action. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I want to um, go back to one thing that you said. I don't want her self-worth to come from the fact that she started learning swimming. I think this is such a beautiful and a very important point, uh, Jennifer. I want to little bit talk about that because uh, so early on, it makes the child start to feel that only when I do something am I worthy. Otherwise, I'm not, right? That's some conditioning that comes in. So can you talk a little bit and how you, um, uh, or whatever, whatever you want to share about that? Yeah, no, I think, I think you just said that so beautifully. We don't want our children to feel like unless they achieve a task, they're not smart enough or bright enough or, or that we don't see them in that kind of beautiful light of who they are, you know? I think uh, uh, that's a very important point to note for uh, us parents and teachers also, right? Like we uh, put so much of emphasis on the grades, the achievement. So what does that, what experience in the world does that give a child who's always on a different timeline and not quite getting things the same way and needing adaptations 
And then when mm -hmm. they reach the goal, there's always another carrot dangling, you know? And mm -hmm. what we need to understand about these kids at school as well is that they are working so much harder than anyone else to be there. And so at the end of the day, they need that quiet. And there may be meltdowns and there may be meltdowns throughout the day, but they are just working so, so hard. That's, that's really true. And um, I think uh, when we start seeing this, when we start understanding it, the child feels seen and heard. You just have to see it from the honesty of your heart and they feel that energy of being seen, right? Uh, I want to, to ask you um, two things, uh, Jennifer. One is, um, what can parents do? Uh, I, I know we spoke about meditation a little bit, but what can parents do to um, look at this breaking of the fantasy eye to eye? And uh, what, like, if you want to share anything personal that helped you, what, uh, how does one do this? Definitely self care foremost, most important self care. Mm -hmm because the more that our cup is filled the more that we are able to handle what life throws at us and i think that is so key it's taking care of ourselves making sure that we get breaks making sure that we're still doing things that light us up mm -hmm. and then also for me one of the biggest things was working with a neurobehavioral facilitator like i am now and really understanding what my child's experience was. It gave me so much more patience. It allowed me to really understand what she was experiencing and so that I could be there for her and I could help her in the ways that she needed help. You know, and that was to be seen and to be understood and to have my child be seen that, you know, intrinsically there is nothing wrong with her. It was life changing, absolutely life changing. And then, of course, you know, getting into more of the conscious parenting and understanding why I was behaving the way that I was, where my expectations were coming from, mm -hmm. and and also going through the grief process as well. And there's times that that still comes up, you know, even from the place of acceptance that I am now. You know, when my child's friends kind of age out of play with her, that's hard. It's hard to watch, you know, so it's it's you're kind of in and out of it. And that's OK. You just have to kind of accept things as they come. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, want to reiterate the importance of um, taking the help of a coach and um, especially one who specialized in the area that you're looking for because um, for the viewers it's sometimes we don't even see what we don't see and when we are sitting in the muck of it it's only an air, uh, the outsider or the aerial view that gives you this picture and that's exactly what the coach is doing is throwing light and while you have a neurodiverse child and you're caught up in this expectation being broken there is a back story there of your own uh, pain that is coming up too so it's very hard for you to yourself the handle both uh, like juggling it it's it's a lot of expectations from yourself you know and uh, that's why the coach can help you do this and um, I'll tell them uh, at this point Jennifer if somebody wants to uh, get in touch with you where can they find you yeah so I'm always happy to take any questions that anyone may have and connect um, and so if you would like to ask any questions or you'd like to know about the facets neurobehavioral model or any training that I offer or you'd like to book an appointment you can reach me at shiningdiversely at gmail.com or you can check out my Instagram handle at Shining Families. Any of you who are looking for it, uh, you can find the details in the description. Uh, do you have anything else you want to share, Jennifer, which I uh, missed out asking? Um, yeah, I think we pretty much covered everything. I know something you wanted to talk a little bit about as well was about the languaging. Yes. Behind yes. Uh, behind yes. Um, disability and what is acceptable. 
And I just wanted to share that I think that it depends on where the person is in their process. And so it's very individual. So for someone who um, has an invisible disability, say, or someone who has just found out about their child's disability, they might need the word disability in order to feel seen, accepted, and to let others know what their experience is in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And then I know for me, it's kind of been an evolution. So it started off as my child has intellectual disability. Then it moved into my child has special needs mm -hmm. or extra needs. And that was a time where I was really seeking services and seeing how I could kind of go into this fix it mentality. Mm -hmm. And then it shifted into my child has exceptionalities, meaning I know that my child is special and has a different way of being in this world. And now it's shifted into my child is neurodivergent, which essentially just means that she's wired a little bit differently and is fully included. And that I understand that all of us intrinsically mm -hmm. are neurodivergent. So that's been kind of my evolution through it. And so I think it's really important to honor the families where they are in that moment, but we can also model the language of neurodiversity, neurodivergence, so that we're kind of normalizing that this is all okay. You know, everyone is experiencing this and there is full acceptance. First of all, yes. actually, we are all neurodiverse. And then that opens up the idea that everything is acceptable. Yes. You know? So I just thought I would share that with you. Yes, I, I love how you uh, portrayed your evolution of the language. It's so beautiful. And that is one of the, uh, what do you call it, tenant of meditation or uh, even the spiritual path is to see oneness in everyone. And when you start seeing that anything in the other is there in you. So that itself gives such an opening and such a big heart to encompass all of us. It's that normalizing is a very... Uh, no, nutritive and healing energy I feel in the same point I think we spoke about ability in disability which we were speaking about right do you want to talk a little bit about that I think that um, you know it's really important that when we are dealing with these challenges and creating accommodations that we're always coming from a strength-based lens so you know it doesn't matter what the disability is, there is always abilities in it, there's always interests, there's always things that the child likes that can really help to, you know, accommodate them and make them feel more comfortable and to feel seen and cherished because this is what our human needs are, right? We need to be seen, we need to be heard, we need to be delighted in, right? Yes. These are needs that all of us have. And so coming from a strength-based approach, we can allow these kids to show us what their abilities are. I, I have this really beautiful video that I often show in um, webinars, and it is about Tim, and Tim has Down syndrome, and he has opened his own restaurant. And so the reason I love to show this is just that it shows that anything is possible for these kids. You know, anything is possible and just supporting them can just lead to the most remarkable life journey. I will put that video link as well in the um, in the, sh the notes, the description, and I recommend people watch it just for you to just like how Jennifer says so radiantly that anything is possible and that is really true anything is possible all it needs is an open mind and an open uh, heart for it to happen I and, guess and I know that's so much what the Montessori model is about is following the child's interests and so I, I just love that and I think too that it's important to say that you know for our kids that are having really big behaviors it's really real for us and it is a test of our patience. And so being curious about what their experience is and what could potentially be triggering them can be such a huge stress relief for everyone involved, whether it's a teacher or a caregiver, a healthcare provider, knowing what is actually happening for the child can really change those behaviors mm -hmm. and really reduce stress for everyone. Mm -hmm. 
so that's so beautiful i think we've spoken all we can about it in this present moment i'm sure there's always so much and that's why you can get in touch with jennifer if you want to know more about any of these topics that we spoke about today and of course you can get in touch with me if you want to know about montessori and uh, that aspect of it and so um i guess that this is such an amazing conversation jennifer i want to take this moment to uh deeply thank you again for being here and so patiently answering um the questions and from your heart and from your experience um i feel it and i'm sure everybody who listens will feel it too so thank you for being here and thank you all for listening uh please do subscribe so we'll see you again with another conversation but until then be curious and find out more about neurodiversity thank you and bye bye